I can take him. You're emotional. I can take him. We need to adjust. Welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. The Book of Boba Fett had a big, action-packed finale, but the uneven nature of the show's structure left a lot of fans with questions and plot holes about the series. So, I'm here to answer them as best I can. Are you ready? I am ready. Great, let's do it. We had a lot of questions about the final battle, in particular questions about the Scorpionek Annihilator droids. We had a a lot of questions. A very detailed question came from BN who says, those two Scorpionek droids should have totaled the whole city with ease. Look at some of the Wikipedia notes on them. A single annihilator droid took out three of the four platoons of clone troopers that had been advancing on the shielded factory. A single annihilator could decimate a dozen ATTEs and make them nothing more than smoking husks. All right. I'm going to lead off with the nerdiest response of all time, but Wikipedia is an independent fan site. If it doesn't come from StarWars.com, then it's not canon. Plus, the books quoted on the Scorpionek Annihilator page on Wikipedia are all books that aren't technically canon anymore after Disney bought Lucasfilm. But let's just say these droids are in the canon. In fact, let's say that in their prime, this is exactly what these droids were capable of. Well, now it's several years later. These droids are older. They're from the Clone Wars. And the Pikes don't necessarily have the parts and tools to keep them up to factory efficiency. If anything, we should be happy that we're getting to see exactly how powerful these droids are in canon. I mean, they're way more powerful than the droid destroyers that we saw in the prequels. Let's go. In fact, they're so powerful that a lot of people asked why the Empire doesn't just use droids instead of stormtroopers. Even the dark troopers we saw in season two of The Mandalorian are way more efficient than stormtroopers. Well, it all comes down to cost. Remember the Death Star, Palpatine's pet project ever since Attack of the Clones? I will take the designs with me to Burrow Center. They would have been much safer there with my master. Even the Death Star was in competition for funding with Thrawn's TIE Defenders. Your TIE Defender program is at risk. Orson Krennic has been quite persuasive about diverting the funding to his own project, Stardust. There's also a big discussion about this in the Bad Batch, as the Empire transitions away from clones to conscripts because of the cost. Clone troopers will be needed to maintain order throughout the galaxy. Indeed, a service conscription soldiers could provide at half the cost. We also had a lot of questions about how Boba Fett's business dealings actually work. How does he make money if it's not from Spice? Well, you know, it's Star Wars. Everyone's always working an angle to get paid. Han's always broke. The bounty hunters always have to negotiate to get a fair deal. You know, you know. 50,000, no less. I like the rush of a bargain too, which is why I like using DealDash, the sponsor of this video. DealDash.com is an auction site that makes deals come true. They have hundreds of auctions each day. You can win just about any item you can think of. TVs, jewelry, clothes, furniture, computers, even cars, and you can get these for up to 90% off. So here's how it works. You find an item you like on the site, and there are hundreds of auctions to choose from every day. Every time you bid, it raises the price by one cent. Then the other bidders have 10 seconds to place their own bids. If no one does, you win the auction. Plus, shipping is always free. Even if you buy like a sofa or a truck? Yes, shipping is always free and there is a 90 day money back guarantee. But how can these companies sell items for so little money? Well, Doug, I'm glad you asked. A lot of your favorite big box retailers throw away perfectly good inventory every day. So Deal Dash partners directly with brands and inventory liquidators to get great savings on brand new products. Then they pass those savings on to the Deal Dash community. Now they charge a small fee to bid in the auctions, but if you use the buy it now option, you get all those bids back. Then you can buy the item for the listed price, get all your bids back and use them in another auction. So go to DealDash.com, enter the promo code SCREENCRUSH, and get 100 bids with your first bid pack purchase. That's DealDash.com, enter the promo code SCREENCRUSH, and start bidding today. Back to Boba Fett. Elite Nosferatu on Twitter says, so everyone's shooting at the big droid the whole time, its shields are up. Why, once the shield is down, does everybody just stop shooting and only watch the Rancor do all the fighting? Even when the Rancor is struggling, no one helps out. Well, Elite Nosferatu, it's real easy to judge combat when you're not right in the sh isn't it? You never know what you're going to do in the heat of battle when your boss is riding a giant monster that's fighting a giant robot. I myself probably would also just stop and watch for a while. But to get real, for one thing, shields absorb energy and they can become overloaded. So the more you shoot at a shield, the more likely you are to weaken it. So, I mean, there's no harm at shooting at the darn thing when the shields are up. As for the Rancor, I'm sure they didn't want to hit it or even worse, hit Boba Fett, accidentally knock him off, and then you have a runaway Rancor on your hands. I happen to think that when your boss shows up in a fight riding a Rancor, 
or you let him do his thing. Now, Pabs here had a really great point. Den says, Our energy weapons can't get through and our kinetic weapons have too much velocity. So why did they not just walk through the shield and then attack it? Why didn't Den just walk through and then use his Darksaber? Well, that's exactly what Den does. When the battle droid transfers all of its power to the front to fend off the Rancor, Den goes around the back. The reason they didn't just do this from the beginning is that the shields are too powerful. I also think the shields being smaller means that they have a greater surface tension. Kind of like how the Gungan shields were so big, they were great at dissipating energy, but the droids could just walk straight through. Pabs also asked, why did no one think to roll a grenade into the shield of the attack droids? In fact, there is an episode of the Clone Wars where the Jedi teach Saw Gerrera and other partisans how to roll thermal detonators into the force field to get to adjust perfect. Their movement. <laughs> Well, look, the easy answer to this is no one had any detonators around. Also, I don't think many of these people fighting have experience fighting droids because they were all like kids during the Clone Wars. I mean, the mods weren't even born at that point. We had a lot of questions about the big climactic battle. Lord Nathan asked, the main thing I noticed in the finale was shots hitting their armor hurt them when all the other times they just bounced off them with little to no damage. You mean like this? We have a deal. Don't even get me started on Star Wars armor. Like how Stormtrooper armor can't stop blaster bolts or even rocks. So let's look at a couple places here. Right here, you can see a blaster hit Den's armor. It doesn't hurt him, but he does recoil. So the energy of a blaster bolt does physically push you. I'm sure the impact still stings, like getting hit with a paintball, and the armor shoves against your muscles. But here, the blaster bolt hits Boba Fett's van brace, making him pivot and fall off balance. Now, I like that their armor is impervious to damage, but they still feel every hit. Otherwise, they would just be invincible, like me when I play laser tag. Stick together, then zap, 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 what the? Oh, why? How'd you learn to do that? David Gallagher on Twitter asked, does Boba Fett's backpack missile regenerate? Because he fired it mid-episode, but somehow was able to reload it between then and the final showdown. David, come on, man. He fires the rocket at the droids. Then he leaves to get his Rancor, and when he comes back, he has a rocket. So we got a new rocket back at the palace. I mean, wouldn't you? It's like running in the house during a water fight. You gotta get loaded for bear. From Nate Walter, when he got thrown off the droid, his Darksaber fell out of his hands and onto the ground, yet he never grabbed it after the cut, and I didn't see him use it again after that. All right, look, we actually got this question a lot. So I'm really gonna take my time to answer this. So here we see the Darksaber falling away from him. Then Grogu saves his life, and here we can see it back by his side. Then he clambers away from it, we cut to the droid. Then we cut to the Peli, Grogu, and we see Din getting up from the ground. He could have easily gone back and grabbed the Darksaber during that time. And then a little later in the battle here, we can clearly see it on his side. A lot of other people pointed this out. Did you see it? The gaffy stick appears to flip around the other way. Really, it doesn't. The pointy end of the stick twists behind his legs. There's just like a few frames missing. I mean, this is a show that accidentally showed us part of the set a few episodes ago, so like, let's forgive the editor for cheating a few frames. Now, a lot of people asked why the Tuscans didn't help at the end. After all, the show did a good job of raising doubt that they were actually all dead. They no longer exist. Are you sure? And Boba seemed like that he was going off to get them. We need reinforcements. From where? You've run out of friends. Protect the others. Well, the answer is there are lots of Tuscan tribes roaming all parts of the Dune Sea. Boba was only associated with the one tribe, the one that was slaughtered. Now, eventually, maybe he could have led them all to unite against the Offworlders, but sadly, that didn't happen. So he would have no pool with the other tribes of the Sand People. Xander Alpert asked, why was Cursitan only able to seek cover with assistance with a broken foot, but one minute later, he was able to keep up with everyone else? Okay, so check this out. He comes into battle. He's dragging his foot. Maybe not broken, but definitely injured. Then he gets a rest. Boba Fett says, I owe you a nice long soak in the back to tank when this is done. But then, four minutes later, he's running. So what? He's feeling better. He's running on adrenaline. Wookiees are fast healers. Whatever. Then he gets knocked around by the droid, re-aggravating his foot injury. Then, he's running again, like a minute later. My take on this is that Wookiees are very tough, and he was able to fight through the pain. I mean, we saw how fast Chewbacca recovered from his arm injury in The Force Awakens. <laughs> 
You must be so brave. In fact, off screen, maybe somebody even used one of those healer things on Cursitan. See, he kept trying to fight through the pain and he kept getting overwhelmed. Makes sense to me. Now let's talk about the Rancor. Eric Mork says that in Return of the Jedi, a Rancor dies because a gate fell on it. In the book of Boba Fett, a Rancor is shot, stabbed, and burned multiple times, and it's fine. Yeah, but think about how heavy that gate would have been because it was designed to hold in a Rancor. Not only that, but it had pointy ends, man. That would have broken its spine immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I loved how the Rancor fighting worked in this episode, even when it was sprayed with fire. The first time, it didn't really understand, it was scared. But then, it learned and adapted, so the second time it was sprayed with fire, it was able to shrug it off. Zero Hunter X5 wants to know how far Jabba's palace is from the city and how fast the Rancor can run. I guess because Boba Fett returned to the battle so fast. I'm thinking the palace must be very close, because Mos Espa is the town that's directly under palace control. It's also where Jabba was in audience to watch the pod race. Boba Fett walked to town like 30 times during the show, so let's just say it's close by. And as for how fast a Rancor can run, well, Moochie moved pretty fast in the Bad Batch. And you never know, Boba might have loaded this one up on a tractor trailer and hauled her in that way. We also had a lot of random miscellaneous questions about Tatooine and some other plot holes in the series. Lloyd Thomas on Twitter asks, do they mine spice on Tatooine or do they bring it into one location and then have to ship it around the planet by train? If it's mined there, why don't they just blow up the mine? If not, why do they need to transport it around the planet by train when they have spaceships and stuff? Well, as far as I know, the only place where they mine spice is on Kessel. It's like the Arrakis of Star Wars. But Tatooine is a major criminal transport hub in the Outer Rim. Because it's so sparsely populated, it rarely attracts the attention of the New Republic, who are mostly focused on the mid and core systems. So my take here is the Pikes transport the spice to Tatooine in one spaceport. Maybe they process it, maybe they have a place where they step on it to dilute it so they can make more money off of it. Then they have to transport it to another place. As for why they don't transport the supply directly from the location where they land, you gotta move the stuff around a little bit. You gotta move the stash house. You know what I'm saying? You keep off your back that way. I mean, we have seen that Tatooine is at least lightly patrolled from space with these X-Wings, so they're going to want to move the stuff around to keep the law on their toes. Senseless Babble on Twitter asks, where do they find wood on Tatooine? You never see trees, but there sure is a lot of wood for campfires. But actually, this person does offer up a good fan theory. The wood grows underground like the black melons. The wood comes from a root system, not tall trees like we have here on Earth. I actually love this fan theory. It fits in with the idea that Tatooine used to be a lush, oceanic world. Now, like, all that greenery is still there, it's just retreated beneath the sands. Cody Hendrick mentions that Luke has Yoda's lightsaber, even though it was incinerated in a public display in the comics. And yes, that did happen. The Emperor made a big show of destroying the Jedi's lightsabers as a celebration that their betrayal had failed. But, in another comic book, we see Yoda contemplating rebuilding his lightsaber during his exile. So, Luke would have found this rebuilt lightsaber among his personal effects on Dagobah. Master Babington asks, what was the point of the Hut Twins? They seemed shady and powerful, but surrendered very quickly. Why didn't they join the Pikes? Also, didn't Vader kill the Hut Council in the comics? All very good questions. There's a lot about this show structure that didn't work very well. Awkwardly placed flashbacks, random threats that went nowhere. I think the Huts were brought in because we expected the Huts to be a major threat. They're Huts. But it turns out that there was a bigger fish out there that we should have been more afraid of. The Pikes. As for why they surrendered and didn't join the Pikes, we learned this about the twins. The twins are preoccupied with the debauchery of Hutter, to bother with any ambitions on Tatooine. So the twins weren't really in the family business, they just benefited from the family business. Like Connor in Succession. Kendall? Kendall! And Shiv? Love Shiv. And what about Roman? These huts are more like playboys who thought about getting involved, but then thought better of it. And yes, Vader did execute the hut council in the comics, which left only Jabba in charge. So once Jabba was gone, the entire hut criminal empire was up for grabs. Nagdog on Twitter asks if Cobb Vance going to come back in his own series. I don't know, maybe. I think now he just owes Boba Fett a debt, and Boba will send him out into the galaxy to try to expand his friendly criminal empire. After all, this is how he won the loyalty of Fennec Shand. But fate sometimes steps in to rescue the wretched. In my case, Boba Fett was that fate. And we had a lot of questions about Cad Bane. From Fister on Twitter, did Finnick not recognize Cad Bane from the Bad Batch episode? I mean, of course she recognized him, he's Cad Bane. He almost killed her. <gasps> I just don't think she felt the need to say, you are Cad Bane. We fought on the remains of a Kaminoan base for the life of a clone child named Omega. Mean Rice on Twitter asks, is Fennec working for someone else? Because the swift disposal of all their enemies after a season of not doing much to me says she's holding back. I mean, no, she 
pretty obviously displayed she's not working for anyone else. She took down the assassins, broke into Jabba's palace, and went Colonel Willard on the pikes. When was she ever not a badass? Also, this was the first time they knew where they could find the pike leadership, and as soon as they knew, the first person they sent there was Fennec Shand. Gillis Francois on Twitter asks if Cad Bane knew that Omega was Boba's sister. Wouldn't he bring that up during the duel? I don't think he knew or cared that Omega and Boba Fett were unaltered clones. Also, no one seems to ever bring up that Boba has the same face of millions of clone troopers scattered around the galaxy, apart from here. You are a clone. I've heard your voice thousands of times. And it just hasn't come up. Cad Bane in particular wouldn't care about a failed job to catch a kid 30 years ago. I think it's much better that they just implied the backstory that was planned to be told in the Clone Wars. I'm not a little boy any longer, and you are an old man. Psylocke242 asks why the Pike Syndicate, a galaxy-wide, endlessly funded criminal organization, bothered sending Cad Bane to negotiate with Freetown, a village of 50 people max, instead of just bombing it. Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious. They didn't want to get noticed. They just want to move their spice and be left alone. Killing a bunch of sand people is one thing. I mean, no one cares about them. They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. Those Tuscans walk like men. Vicious, mindless monsters. But kill a whole village of civilians? That's the kind of thing the New Republic notices. And we did see that there are cops patrolling the planet. Was I doing something wrong, officer? You're not allowed to fly that fast next to a commercial ship. Pabs asks, why did the Pikes give up so easily? They lost two droids and a few of their people, but surely that wasn't their best force. Well, there is such a thing as the sunk cost fallacy. They could see that it was going to take a very large force to hold the planet, and they would always be challenged by the locals. In fact, they lost all their local warlords, so they decided to cut their losses. Basically, Tatooine was more trouble than it was worth. And we had a lot of questions about the final battle and Mos Espa. Dungeon Talk says, they stayed in town to protect it, but there was no reason to think that the Pikes would attack the town. They had bombed the business because it was Fett's. They wanted Fett gone or dead, so they would have attacked him in the palace. Instead, they stayed in the town, which caused the battle to happen there, and endangered people. Sure, but the whole reason they fought in town wasn't strategic, it was symbolic. If you want to abandon Mas Espa and hide in your fortress, go ahead. The people who live here need our protection. Fett wanted to rule the people with respect. He refused to be carried on a litter because he wanted to be seen as a fighter. If he would have won from his palace, then he would have been unable to rule Mos Espa. So he had to win in town or not at all. But from another perspective, his decision to make his final stand in town caused all sorts of damage that the people would resent. Matt Singer says, why does everyone love Boba Fett now when his plan to save the town involved his rancor destroying a huge chunk of Mos Espa? Well, for one thing, the Pikes are the aggressors here. They're the ones who brought their forces into Mos Espa a place where Boba Fett was already the daimyo. So he was protecting his territory from them. Also, they brought in battle droids, and there's still a lot of lingering resentment toward these droids after the Clone Wars. Your droids, they'll have to wait outside. We don't want them here. So yeah, the Rancor went nuts and destroyed a big chunk of the city, which is another reason why they want to keep Boba Fett happy, so he won't send the Rancor in to destroy the city. Uh, and I just want to say how much my wife and I appreciate you not letting them monkeys out. Although I figure I gotta let him out sometime. Tomorrow. Connor McDonald says, it's completely unbelievable they would stay in the sanctuary. It's a structurally compromised building with one exit and can be approached from three different angles. Well, we don't know that it has one exit. But as for it being structurally compromised, the inside is burned out, but it seems to take hits pretty well. The sanctuary is symbolic. It was a Mos Espa hub under Boba Fett's protection, so he needed to be seen defending it. And it can be approached from three different streets, which all intersect at the same point, creating a bottleneck. The strategy was actually working out pretty well till the Annihilator droid showed up. And finally, we had a few questions about Luke and the new Jedi Order. Dennis says, Luke is a different character than he was in Return of the Jedi. The ultimatum he gives Grogu in Boba Fett Episode 6 is completely out of character and flies in the face of what the original trilogy was all about. He didn't have to choose between being a Jedi and saving his father and friends. His connection to them is what made him different from Yoda and Ben. They wanted him to forsake his attachments by ignoring his friend's peril on Cloud City and killing his father. I can't kill my own father. Then the Emperor has already won. But he forged his own path, taking the middle road. So does being a Jedi mean detachment from the people you love? Are we really supposed to believe that Luke said goodbye to his friends and family right after Return of the Jedi and lived a monastic life apart? I doubt it. All right, these are some really good points. And in previous videos, we've also pointed out that it was Luke's attachment to his father, seeing the good in him, that redeemed him. Your thoughts betray you, father. I feel the good in you. But remember, it was also his attachment to Leia that nearly caused Luke to turn to the dark side. You have a twin sister. 
If you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. I think Luke's basically only had a few days on the job and he's learning as he goes. He spent all this time gathering Jedi artifacts, watching holocrons, learning how the old Jedi Order worked, trying to learn what makes a Jedi a Jedi. He's also taking advice from Ahsoka Tano, who was trained in the old ways. The thing is, you're right, Luke was not able to keep up this detachment method of training because he's going to train someone he loves, his nephew Ben. So in many ways, his academy was doomed from the start. It's a hard pill to swallow, but failure makes for a more interesting story than success. And a lot of people asked how Din was able to find the Jedi Academy. And Robert Pitts on Twitter even added, are the Jedi still in hiding? They don't want to be made public yet, but the Empire's gone, so why not? As for how he found Grogu, I'm going to assume it was a tracking fob because that's how he found him in the first episode. As for why the Jedi are still in hiding, I don't think it would be smart for Luke to advertise his Jedi Order at this point. There are a lot of enemies out there, like crime syndicates or Imperial remnants, who wouldn't want to see a new Jedi Order. Not to mention the Imps were already hunting for Grogu's blood. Now, as we saw in the sequel trilogy, the new Order barely got off the ground, and people were still convinced that the Jedi weren't even real. The Jedi were real. So clearly, keeping it a secret paid off. That's all the plot holes we're going to answer today, but if you have any more plot holes or questions, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.